and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Krista Bernalikin. And I'm Dr. Lindsay Renzullo, and we are joined today by a very special guest. Um, Christina Malloy is here from MassVet uh, visiting, and she Mass wanted to... MassVet Referral Hospital. Yeah, I should say that. I should be at the Yeah. Um, here visiting, and she is going to tell us a little bit about herself and about her role at MassVet. Could you and... tell us, uh, the audience what... What she is. No, it's what I was going to let her do. Okay. Oh, do I want to let her do it or should we <laughs> no, do it? No, you should. Okay. Well, she is a social worker. She is a licensed, certified social worker that works at our sister hospital, Mass Vet Referral Hospital. And she's here today to talk a little bit about what that means and what her role is at the hospital. So, so welcome. Tell us about yourself. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, my name is Christina Malloy. I've been with Mass Vet for about a year and a half. Um, it's a great position and we do a lot of stuff for both the clients and the staff at the hospital. Excellent. So where are you, are you originally from the area? Um, I grew up in New York mm -hmm. and I moved to Boston. I went to BU, mm -hmm. Boston University for my undergrad and I just never left. Nice. Very good. Yeah. I was across the river from you. Oh yeah. yeah up at you MIT. Were the yes, I was. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, what is a veterinary or are you a veterinary social worker? Or are you, you know, is there a distinction where you get certifications for that specifically? Um, there is one program where you can get a, a certificate declaring you as a veterinary social worker. It's more the title of the position. Mm -hmm. So I'm a social worker in all sense, you know, but the veterinary side of it is just where I'm located. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's not too many paths where you can get um, training specifically in veterinary social work. The term was started at the University of Tennessee with, um, I believe Dr. Elizabeth Strand created the program there where they have a school of social work and a veterinary school in the same place and that's kind of how it started. Uh, but I went to school, I got my master's in social work at Simmons in Boston, a traditional clinical path, um, not really animal focused in any way. Uh, sometimes people kind of struggled with what I was trying to push forward. They didn't quite get what what I was doing. So you've wanted to kind of be in some animal centric field for since the beginning or? Yeah, I um, originally wanted to go to vet school and when I was working in GP after I was at Boston University, I really fell in love with the human animal bond. And at that time I thought the only way that I could make a career out of that was animal assisted therapy. So I have a golden retriever that was being trained as a therapy dog and along the way I found veterinary social work. I found that it was a thing that I could do. I could make a career out of it. So that's how I decided to go back and get my master's. That's great. And then right after you got your master's did you decide to go directly into this field or did you do something beforehand? I went directly into this field. It was just sheer luck and timing that MassVet was looking for someone and I I was there. I said, hey, I have a background in veterinary medicine and this is what I want to do. Um, there are not too many positions available up in this area and starting to expand, but MassVet has the third, I'm the third one in the state. Wow. Um, so it, there aren't too many opportunities up here yet if you're looking for a position in this field, but it, it is expanding in areas where there are these programs like Tennessee, uh, Colorado, there are more veterinary social workers out there. Yeah, I remember when we actually got the, the email that you would be starting and it was sort of really exciting because it's something that I think in the veterinary field we really need mm -hmm. and I just don't think it's been given enough attention to over the years, but I think that there's a culture that's going to be starting to change. Mm -hmm. um, so when you go to MassVet or Massachusetts Veterinary Referral Hospital, what do you do there sort of on like a day-to-day -day basis when you get to work? Yeah. Um, every day is different, and it's something that we're still kind of developing as we go. I've been there for a year and a half, but it's not something where there's like a set idea of how a program like this is supposed to roll out because every hospital is so different and the needs of every hospital are so unique. Um, so what I do, I would say that I split my time pretty evenly 50-50 between the needs of the staff and the needs, client needs. Mm -hmm. um, among clients, probably the biggest thing that I work with is pet loss. I have some pet loss support groups over there. Um, it could be individual counseling that I meet with people. Uh, it could be end of life decision making or a new diagnosis or chronic caregiving stress, you know, that can be really mm -hmm. overwhelming. Um, and then the rest of it is, is working with staff. Mm. So do they come in, do, does a vet say, oh, this client seems like they need a little extra help with this and come and kind of grab you? Or do you tend to kind of walk around and see 
who might need help yeah. or is a little combination of both? Yeah, it's definitely both. Uh, I make sure that I do my loops around the hospital pretty frequently, yeah. uh, but it can, it's, a lot of it comes from vet referrals or text or, as well, yeah. Yeah, or even staff. at the front desk because they're the ones that are seeing the clients come in. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be introduced to a client by the veterinary team member, so they can say, hey, we have a counselor, a social worker on staff that's, you know, trained to help help with difficult mm -hmm. emotional situations like this. Would you like to speak with her? Or if they're not comfortable doing that, they can come to me and then I can reach out to the client mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. Do they sort of provide your information when someone has had a pet loss or something really hard going on, like provide your card to set up like appointments? Um, yeah, things, it, it doesn't have to be by appointment. It's, it's pretty flexible, yeah. um, but we have cards. We have flyers in the hospital and in the bereavement rooms um, talking about the pet loss support groups and my services there. Mm -hmm. And I believe with every uh, euthanasia that they have at the hospital, when they give the information to the client to take home, my information is in there as mm -hmm. well. And I find it interesting that you say, you know, pretty much your time you think is sort of spent half and half between clients and staff. And I think that a lot of the times, you know, the staff, the, the toll that some of the stuff can take on the staff is sometimes overlooked because sometimes it's one of those things where we would obviously think that it's really hard on the clients seeing their pet, you know, passing away or really sick. Um, but there is a huge toll that the staff takes as well because they are people that came into this because they love animals. And it's really, really hard sometimes for us to see either people this sad or to see the animals this sad. So I think it's like a great resource to have for, for those people as well. Do you find it to be more of the end of life situations or could it be a variety of different situations that you're dealing with with the staff? Oh, it's definitely a variety. Um, it can be, you know, the stress, any of the stressors that you might encounter on a daily basis. Definitely the frequency, frequency of euthanasias or end-of-life discussions happens more in this field and say our human medicine mm -hmm. counterparts are you know we're experiencing it up to five times more mm -hmm. um, in this field and that can take its toll um, that contributes to something called secondary traumatic stress and that can lead to compassion fatigue so I do a lot of wellness talks as well and I talk to staff about what compassion fatigue is what it might look like how to identify it um, my favorite topic to talk about that anyone will tell you is self-care. Um, I talk to people about self-care, maybe ideas for self-care, the importance of it, making time, uh, and setting setting those boundaries so that you do have the time to take care of yourself. Mm. Yeah, setting boundaries. That's you know something we talked about before. This was a lot of what we we go into this and we see. We are being asked not just to be doctors or technicians or receptionists were asked also to then also do sometimes therapy or sometimes yep. financial management. And there are things that is sort of expected as a baseline, but I don't know that there's always as much recognition in the general public that we weren't trained for that, mm -hmm. you know, and I wasn't trained to, you know, tell your son who's four and I actually, yes, I have kids, but I don't necessarily know how to talk with kid, every kid, mm -hmm. like, tell that kid what this diagnosis is. Like, that's really not my place. But there's things like that yeah. that we're asked to do all the time. Like, well, I need you now to explain it to my husband, and now I need you to talk him into this thing that I can't, and I don't know your husband. <laughs> you know? It's hard. People management is really hard in juggling that when there's high emotions on the table, especially. It doesn't have to be pet loss either. No, it can right. just sometimes right. be, this is the treatment that we recommend, and one member of the family is more emotionally invested than right. the other. And yeah, that's all very intriguing and probably what you love about it, actually. Right. Yeah, and there are just, there are so many other factors. Like you were saying, you know, it's not just the veterinary medicine part of it, but maybe you have a new diagnosis, a pet that was recently diagnosed with cancer, and that client may have just had an experience a with cancer in their, in their house, family right? or a loss yeah. or yeah. You know, maybe someone's going through losing a housing or a job loss or changes in their life that's contributing mm -hmm. to the stress and most of the time that animal is the way that we cope with the stress mm -hmm. you know right. to help us get through it and when they're sick or when they're going through something um, I'm happy that I can be there to help support them mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. The pet support groups are very interesting Question. to me. So is this sort of, is this a, a group that you formulated to meet on a regular basis where clients can come together and sort of use you as a point person to talk about different issues that they're having? Because I find that to be 
fascinating, like this kind of support groups. Yeah, it's it's a really great environment. Um, it's a pet loss support group. So support groups generally work um, with something that we call mutual aid, where I'm just there, I facilitate the group, but the people in the group share their own stories and they help each other. Um, you're going to have a group and the people in the group are going to be at different stages in the grieving process. You might have someone who just lost their pet that week, someone who's been coming for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and they help each other. Mm -hmm. And they validate those feelings of loss because so often when I talk to someone about pet loss, they don't have that support out, outside of the group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they hear things like, oh, well, you know, just, just get another cat. cat. Or, yeah. right. um, they don't understand yeah. that that's, that's a family member. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a way for people to get that support and have their feelings validated that it is a significant loss. Hmm. Did you have, you have some questions? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, one is that this is a very unique position. Is this something that you're seeing more throughout the country at different specialty hospitals? Absolutely. Um, it is expanding. Um, it, it depends on where, it depends on the region um, and how many large hospitals there are. It's definitely something that's seen at, at bigger hospitals like mm -hmm. MassVet. We have like 250 staff members, 300 staff members. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine because it's veterinary field is still very fragmented, and yeah. so, you know, there are large hospitals like ours, mm -hmm. but by and large, it's still a lot of just one or two doctor practices sure. that would have a hard time themselves yeah. having someone. But maybe, you know, as it expands, it's something where one social worker can be employed right. by multiple places yeah. and do independent consulting and that I kind think of thing. The awareness too of just emotional mental health has just really. Expanded Absolutely. over the past. I'll you know, bet California has a yeah. lot more social workers. <laughs> yeah, they probably do. But I mean, just anything from like post traumatic stress syndrome for all of our veterans that are coming back. I mean, we're just much more aware of mental health yeah, issues. Absolutely. The stigma that's associated a lot of times with mental health, I think, is slowly fading away. Mm -hmm. And that this is something that's sort of coming up in front and saying, well, look, this is not an important need for veterinary medicine. And, you know, like Dr. Bernalekin said, you know, we often, as the veterinarians or the technicians or receptionists, are the front lines and we're there dealing with the clients and we're trying our best. But our schooling has been in the medicine component of it. So we're inherently empathetic people. We we want to be there for these clients, but sometimes we don't always have the tools or the tips, the techniques to sort of handle those issues. Yeah, and there's definitely room for um, therapists to kind of specialize in treating like pet loss or even veterinarians in private practice because so often if someone a staff member might come to me looking for support out like outside of of what i can provide them but most therapists don't understand what veterinarians go through on a daily basis and um, so i think that alone is a whole other aspect of of therapy that uh, people could go into if they were interested in working with veterinarians or veterinary professionals mm -hmm. get another question um yes this one comes from brianne and she says this is awesome um, is this something that will ever come to Bulger? Perhaps. It's actually, if our hospitals um, can find more people like Christina, then yes, it's something that's definitely we're moving towards. But it does require very specific individuals that are rare, like mm -hmm. you, that have decided that they want to be social workers in specifically this environment. And a lot of the time, I don't even know that they know that it's something right. they can do, right? Because right. you had to forge your own way. Right. right. Um, so... You know, definitely it's something that our company has found value in and we are one of the larger hospitals, so it would move towards us eventually, I think. And what's exciting is, you know, we were talking before the show actually aired and Christina was saying that she does actually have an intern now that's following you around and you're getting another one in the, in the fall. So there obviously is some interest of absolutely. people to go into this particular type of field. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the interns are very excited to mm -hmm. have the, I, like, the possibility of a, a placement like this. Um, but we have to be very careful because sometimes people uh, express interest because they're animal lovers. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. have to be very careful and explain that, you know, what you're going to see animals that are sick and dying. Um, it's, it's not all puppies and kittens. Like everyone kind That's of actually what, veterinary medicine. You know, we TV. say to kids when yeah. I actually, one of my daughters wants to, you know, says she wants to be a vet. And, you know, every time I'm like, okay, but I know, like, I know she's 10, like, she wants to be a vet because of the love of animals, but you know, there's a lot that we have to do that's harder than just that. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, and I'm, I imagine it's similar for people going into technicians, mm -hmm. reception, you know, your field, anything else that involves yeah. animals. Yeah. 
but I could see it being invaluable. Like, and like, you know, I do love the fact that you split that time between the pet owners and the, the workers, mm -hmm. um, just because I do feel like so often the workers are just assumed to sort of, this is part of the job, that's it, you know, but it does take a toll on, on yeah, those people. And absolutely. so being able to have them have some safe place to go to kind of work through some of those issues, I think is great. Yeah. And it was something that I found really interesting and appealing about this job when they were looking, um, they expressed interest that they wanted the position to be very staff focused, which is great because a lot of times veterinary social workers are brought in mostly for the for clients. The clients. Yeah. Um, so my position is even, I think a little bit more unique than some other veterinary social worker positions. Mm -hmm. um, and I really value that I can help the staff. That's and you great. do regular, almost um, support groups with the team as well, right? Um, we do. Like a, I'm not as frequently as the, yeah. the pet loss support mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So do we have any other questions there? No? Not right now. <clears throat> awesome. Well, did you have any other questions, Lindsay? Well, I'm trying to think. I mean, because it I is feel so like there's so much. There's so much. We ask. could probably keep going forever, right, about it. Um, I mean, is it, this is sort of off the cuff, so she might not have an answer. It's totally fine. But do you have, like, a unique or one of your favorite, like, cases? I mean, you probably have some confidentialities, but something where you yeah. really felt like you made or, a like, difference. Or, like, blur out the names. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and um, the breeds. Like, where it really was like, species. wow, I made a difference. Yeah. I saw the situation and, you know, kind of pulled it together. Yeah. It's definitely when I get a note or a thank you from a client um, that highlights like what I helped them with. Um, there was someone that I uh, was helping with pet loss and we were meeting individually and then that person came to the group and shared things with the group that I had I had said to her. You know, she said, oh, that you know, Christina had said this to me and I found it really helpful. And that like, it meant a lot to me that mm -hmm. that was something that stuck with her mm -hmm. um, and, and made a difference. Yeah. So, I mean, do you run into situations sometimes, I, I imagine that you have a lot of resources at your disposal to say, oh, this person actually needs, needs, has medical issues and that they're not having addressed. Do you have some ability to like refer them to other, you know, other professionals? That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. If that's what they're looking for, yeah. absolutely. If they're but looking you like, for... overstep that and like force Right. Them I don't, um, if they're not looking for it, I don't really have any place to do that mm -hmm. um, it's just not really within the yeah. realm of what I do but if someone comes to me and they say hey I'm looking for a therapist or I'm looking for uh, I need a, a new a doctor or PCP or something uh, referrals are definitely something that I can help them mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. and you were talking about again before the air about the certification processes so right now you're you're listed as a licensed certified social worker but mm -hmm. there are other sort of um, more certification levels that you can get and so you were talking about that and what are the differences between that. Yeah, so after your first two years, roughly after uh, you obtain your master's, uh, you're an LCSW in Massachusetts. Um, you have to take a license exam to, to get that um, certification. And then after two years, a certain number of hours pass and supervision hours. Um, so I have like a clinical social worker that I report to you once a week. We kind of discuss cases and things like that. Um, and then after those two years, which for me will be in May, I can take the second license exam, uh, which is where I'll be uh, certified to practice independently. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Yeah. And it's always a master's, bachelor's. What do you? So if someone goes into social work and they start on the path, mm -hmm. they go and get their bachelor's degree, and that's in social work, or is that the kind of thing like it could be in anything? That could be in anything. Yeah. So a lot of people, if they know they want to mm -hmm. go into social work, will do that, and then they can get into an accelerated master's program that's mm -hmm. a year instead mm -hmm. of the um, full two years. Uh, but my degree was, I was pre-med mm -hmm. at BU. I did not know that I was going to go into this field, um, but it's, it's a field where if you're looking for a career change, you don't need a certain undergraduate degree to any to undergraduate get degree, program. and then mm. that's like veterinary. I mean, you just have to have the prerequisites. It's true. Yeah. Like, it yeah. definitely helps. Yeah. Um, there were some things getting into the master's program that I was not as familiar with as mm -hmm. some of my colleagues, but um, it's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. And as a, oh, do you have a question? Uh, well, I was just going to mention too that um, the website, so the new ethos um, website with all the East Region hospitals, so Bulger's new website. It's going to go live uh, probably by the end of this month with nice. all the other East Region and then slowly the rest of the Ethos hospitals. But on all of the hospital pages, there is um, grief resources that we've talked to you about and got your input. So there's like national resources, um, phone That's numbers, great, yeah. different sites and stuff. 
Um, so that's going to be on the hospitals. It's currently on the, the current website as well, mm -hmm. but um, I think the new page is really great because I know we got your input and it's, so it's that's a lot great. of stuff there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was, I guess when, when you go for a master's, mm -hmm. say you've got some other, you know, random degree, let's say, so you don't know a lot about the um, specific coursework. It's a, it's a clinical master's degree, so it's not, is there a thesis that you have to do or? Um, not a thesis at the master's level per se, uh, but a lot of social work master's programs may be divided into a macro level track or a clinical. So macro mm -hmm. might be policy making, mm -hmm. it's on a larger scale. Yeah. Clinical is more one-on-one -on -one therapeutic type training. Mm -hmm. um, the program that I did was both, but heavily clinically focused. Um, and during the two years, it's typically a, a two years full-time, or you could do three or four years part-time. Um, you do two year-long internships, kind of like the intern that I, I have now, uh, where you're at a certain location from September to May, uh, 24 hours a week, um, and two years straight to get um, experience, whether mm -hmm. it's in a field that you want to learn more about, or a field that you've never had experience in before. Uh, for me, I did one in um, senior housing, low-income senior housing in, in the city of Boston, and then my second one was actually at um, Angel Animal Medical Center in mm -hmm. Boston. I imagined that they were one of the others that had this. Yeah. 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 Um, so these, in, you know, not these specific interns, but interns that you have, are they generally in the process of getting their master's, or are they often people that just aren't sure maybe they want to do that as their profession? Typically, they are getting their master's or possibly bachelor's, but mm -hmm. they're they're in one of those clinical uh, Tracks. internships. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's very so, exciting. I love how it's entering into the field. I really do. I think it's very a very positive thing for veterinary medicine as a whole for both the employees and the, the owners. Yeah. And I like being involved at the very beginning mm -hmm. um, to see how it's going to grow and to maybe help the program grow at other hospitals, but especially within within Ethos, like if, if Bulger ever gets a social worker to help develop that program here. Yeah. Then, yeah. You know, it's a great opportunity. It is really exciting. Hey, you're a trailblazer. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> That's awesome. Any other questions from the producing team? Oh, awesome. This well, is like a fun episode. Yeah. It's just cool because it's. It, I feel as though in some ways, Christine, you probably feel this way too, ethos is sort of at the at the beginning of this. It really is. Yeah, Trailblazing, it's exciting. And, yeah. you know, in the next, you know, 10, 20 years or so where this is going to go is pretty, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Do you want to just mention about the, the next episode before we sign off that we're doing a different day? Oh, sure. Uh, day? Well... We don't 100% know our topic for next time, but December 11th is going to be our next podcast episode. We're just going to be airing at slightly a different time. Um, we haven't like an hour it. or two later than yeah, usual. maybe around noon or so. Yeah. So keep looking out for the post. We'll sort of uh, we'll promote it, put yeah. it on there on the Facebook page to let you know what time we're going to be thinking about doing it. But just a little bit later than our usual our usual time slot. So don't forget to go and give us a nice review on any one of the podcasting programs that you use. Mm -hmm. So um, Apple. The Apple Store, the Google Play Store. I'm being prompted because I don't remember. <laughs> all these and thank you, as always, to Ethos, who's our sponsor. And um, I'm going to say goodbye. Yeah, Not so much. signing <laughs> off. Yes, I did. <laughs> so thanks so much. We'll see you next time. And thank you so much, Christina. Yeah, you're welcome.